as uh, everybody in this body knows, we don't give many awards, and we don't give them often. And so uh, it seems particularly appropriate that at a time when we're having our 90th meeting, that we do give an award uh, in the name of an icon of the American legal pre uh, profession to someone who is also an icon. And how lucky for us to have Judge Garland here, the chief judge, as of, uh, as I recall, February 12th. I thought Valentine's Day would have been a better day, but uh, with us, a former friendly clerk, uh, a graduate of both Harvard College and Harvard Law School with extreme honors, a United States Supreme Court clerk, uh, an elegant person in all ways, uh, as we all know, but especially for today, a person who was Judge Friendly's clerk, Judge Garland. Thank you, President Ramo. For the rare and distinct honor of introducing the recipient of the American Law Institute's Henry J. Friendly Medal, William H. Webster. It is a rare answer, honor because, well, it's rare. It is, as the President just told you, it's bestowed in the discretion of the Institute only upon those who have made truly outstanding contributions to the legal pr profession. In the more than 25 years since Judge Friendly's former law clerks endowed the medal, it has been awarded to only 10 people. Sandra Day O'Connor, Nicholas Katzenbach, Ronald Dworkin, Richard Posner, Anthony Lewis, Linda Greenhouse, William Coleman, Herbert Wexler, Paul Freund, and Edward Weinfeld. And it is a distinct honor for me because both Judge Friendly and Judge Webster were important influences in my own early career. As my first job out of law school, I had the great good fortune of clerking for Judge Friendly. As David Dorson's appropriately titled book aptly puts it, Judge Friendly was the greatest judge of his era. He was the greatest for a great many reasons, but only one of them is really important today, and that is that by his example, he taught both his clerks and the profession that judging is not just politics by another name. No friendly clerk ever heard Judge Friendly say anything to suggest that political considerations played a role in any of his decisions, nor could any reader of those decisions have discerned any such intrusion. Two years later, I joined the, great, the, just, the Department of Justice and I had the great good fortune then of interacting, albeit only intermittently, with then FBI Director Webster. Judge Webster's career has been long and his accomplishments are many. <laughs> Navy Lieutenant, U.S. Attorney, District and Circuit Judge, FBI and CIA Director, Law Firm Partner, and currently Chair of the Department of Homeland Security's Advisory Council. But once again, I want to focus on a lesson that Judge Webster taught those of us who worked then at DOJ, a lesson similar to the one taught us by Judge Friendly. That, like judging, law enforcement must be kept separate from politics. Judge Webster came to the Bureau in the wake of Watergate and of revelations of FBI intrusions into constitutionally protected political activities during the 1960s and 1970s. At the Bureau, he instituted reforms that restored both its credibility and its reputation as the premier non-political law enforcement agency. David Dorson's book notes that during the 1968 election campaign, Newsweek, Newsweek reported that Richard Nixon was passing the word that Judge Friendly would be an ideal nominee for the Supreme Court. When that failed to materialize, some, including Judge Friendly himself, blamed Attorney General John Mitchell for rejecting him. It is fitting, then, that today the Friendly Medal goes to a great public servant who was appointed in no small measure because the country had in turn rejected Attorney General Mitchell's vision of how the Department of Justice should operate. In the course of working on this introduction, I thought it would be useful to obtain, through the good offices of Mr. Dorson, 
a piece of actual correspondence between Judges Friendly and Webster. Sure enough, David told me that he had found just such a letter and one relating to the ALI to boot. <laughs> when I read the letter, however, I was sorely tempted to deep six it. But when I asked myself, as I often do, what would Judge Friendly have done, I knew I would have to disclose the letter to you. The letter is dated March 16, 1984, from Henry J. Friendly to William H. Webster, then FBI director and, more important, then chair of the nominating committee of the ALI, a position he held for more than 25 years. The letter is Judge Friendly's recommendation of Judge Pierre Laval for a seat on the ALI Council. The document is filled with encomiums to Pierre. No surprise there. But here is the kicker. Pierre, the judge said, quote, was among the best law clerks that I have ever had right alongside Mike Boudin. <laughs> you see the problem. <laughs> that endorsement forces every self-respecting, friendly clerk to ask the age-old question often attributed to that sage, Jimmy Durante. So what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> In truth, though, the letter makes a nice closing for this introduction. Every friendly clerk knows that Pierre and Mike were indeed the judge's favorite clerks, and appropriately so. Indeed, every friendly clerk knows that the idea for this friendly medal came from Pierre and Mike. Accordingly, it is more than appropriate that today's honoree was the recipient of a letter that contains not only the name of the judge for whom the medal is named, but the names of the two judges who conceived of the award. Judge Webster, I have one more duty I have to, 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 to satisfy before I can hand you the friendly medal. I have to read you two missives that I received early this week. Now, when you were a young man, they would have come in the form of telegrams. This time, they come as emails. The first reads, Dear Judge Garland, as the only judge still around who was a colleague of Judge William Webster, U.S. Court of Appeals, Eighth Circuit, and as, as his friend for 40 years, I send this message of congratulations to Judge Webster, the recipient, and to members of the presenter, ALI, relating to the current Henry Friendly Medal Award. The judges on the Eighth Circuit during William Webster's years on the court and for his public service for all years, including the present time, referred to Bill as a, quote, straight arrow. He was and is a purpose, person of the highest integrity, intelligence, and possessing great wisdom and always a careful understanding of his work, judicial and legal, and as a public servant, as FBI director, CIA director, and in other capacities. Congratulations. Well done, Bill. Sincerely, Myron H. Bright. And the second reads, Judge Garland, Please convey our Eighth Circuit congratulations to Judge Webster for his receipt of the Henry J. Friendly Award. Our admiration of Judge Webster, our legendary colleague, is unsurpassed. Great award choice. We wish you and Judge William Webster all the best. Chief Judge William J. Riley. And now it is my great pleasure to ask the Honorable William H. Webster to step up and receive his medal. Thank you so much, Chief Judge Garland. I'm taking a second to take it all in. I can't tell you how much this recognition means to me. There's so much involved in all of it that it's difficult for me to, to express. This organization is the key to how we support and expand and deal with the rule of law in our country in a way that no other country has enjoyed, and it's meant my membership in it has meant the world to me. My admiration for Judge Friendly is unbounded, always one of my heroes. And uh, to join the ranks of those that uh, Judge Garland mentioned is really quite an experience for me there. 
known to me, and uh, there are many were friends and colleagues. And I particularly think of, uh, most recently, of Tony Lewis, Anthony Lewis, the author of, of Gideon's Trumpet, my favorite book. I have a first edition that's well-worn and reworn, who just passed away. One of the two non-lawyers that I understand were given this recognition. Well, <clears throat> I, I mentioned to Linda this morning that I was thinking of the great Yankee from Olympus, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who wrote to his British friend and said, apologize because he did not have time to write a short letter. <laughs> to which she replied, and she's sitting over there, my wonderful wife, Linda, who is arranging to have a major role in the 100th anniversary this year at Gettysburg of the Battle of Gettysburg, the birthday of Abraham Lincoln and the first award of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And she said, well, if you're thinking about that, just remember that at Gettysburg, one of America's most, amended, or most remembered speeches took two and a half minutes. <laughs> so with that in mind, I will try. I can't do that. But I, I wanted to share a few thoughts about the American Law Institute uh, and how it relates to all of us as lawyers uh, coming from the ranks of the judiciary, from academia, and from the active practice of law in a unique, absolutely unique set of arrangements. Uh, in my own case, uh, I didn't have much trouble because my mother decided when I was two years old that I was going to be a lawyer. <laughs> and that, that ended the discussion. Through the years, my father had to put up with me as a small child making speeches at the dinner table to satisfy her ambitions for me. <clears throat> uh, at one point when I was 15, I thought perhaps I'd do better as a hotel manager where you could make $200 a month. But my guidance director at the high school said to forget it, I was going to be a lawyer. So to cover that ground very quickly, uh, my, my, my march in that direction was interrupted by military service in the Navy. And in both cases, both uh, uh, in World War II and in the Korean War, I had the privilege of serving in legal martial, court martials uh, more, more uh, effectively, I think, in special court martials after I'd become a lawyer. Uh, I never regretted any of the decisions that were made, but I kind of stumbled along through my life uh, responding to occasional calls to duty that I have never regretted. Uh, I was uh, a United States Attorney for the Eastern District, Missouri, back in 1960, as I recall the approximate date. And I also served as a member of the Missouri Board of Law Examiners. And in those capacities, I got to know the Chief Justice of Missouri, Lawrence M. Hyde. And at one point in those long days ago, he said, you know, Bill, you ought to be a member of the American Law Institute. Well, I knew about the restatements because I'd studied them in law school, but I didn't know much about the ALI. He said, I've been in it almost from the beginning. Let me propose you for membership. He did, and I was taken in and attended my first meetings in the old Mayflower Hotel. And for the next several years, I hated those stiff back chairs in the ballroom in those days. I could hardly stand it. They did get improved about 25 years ago. <laughs> but it, but uh, it was a remarkable experience to be exposed to such unique minds, all, uh, as Judge Garland said, without political motivations, with people who've had vast experience and who wanted to make sure that our laws were clarified under the common law system in which we exist so that those who practiced it and those who lived under it could better understand where it was and where we ought to go. And it, I will never forget what a great experience that was for me. Years later, I had the privilege of serving on the district court and then on the Court of Appeals. And I want to mention, I'm so pleased to 
have heard, um, I wasn't present when I think uh, Judge Schroeder revealed that letter from Judge Bright to the uh, council. And uh, I was so pleased to hear from him. He is the oldest sitting judge in the United, federal sitting judge in the United States, and he's still sitting on the Eighth Circuit at the age of 94. And that's, that's an incentive for some of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting closer and closer as time goes along. But that was a that was a uh, a great a great thing to hear from, from him. I had a wonderful experience on the Court of Appeals. Had no intention to leave it, but another fine the gentleman, Attorney General Griffin Bell, persuaded me that at that particular time, I ought to think about coming to the FBI. I had my doubts, my moments of uncertainty. Chief Justice Berger was not sure that was the right place for me. And I found myself on the way to meet with President Carter by dropping by the, by meeting the Attorney General at uh, the Department of Justice. And I passed the office of another member, Wade McCree, who had been on the Sixth Circuit and was serving as Solicitor General of the United States. And I stopped, stuck my head in the door and told him of my concerns. Uh, he put them away in this way, he said, Bill, that's not a, it's not a duty. What you're doing is important, but if you want to make a great gift to your country, I can't think of a better thing or a better time for you to do it. And that sort of washed away my reservation. But I said, there's just one thing, though. I said, I've been told that I'm being nominated to serve on the Council of the American Law Institute, and I guess I'll have to give that up. And Judge McCree said, well, just a minute, we'll call Ami Cutter, who was then leading the ALI, Justice of the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. And he was very brief. Wade may put the problem before him, and he said, well, I'll vote for him. And <laughs> that ended. <laughs> and that's how I found my way to the council. And the years that I got to serve as head of the nominating committee, I had a wonderful group of people sharing that responsibility for me, with me. And uh, I look back on it and think of all the people who helped make sure that we did our jobs in the right way. And I look around at the leadership today, and it's tremendous. And I recognize that that, uh, that help made all, all the difference. I remember little things, and this is why it's going over the two and a half minutes, but I, uh, one of our members, Elizabeth Warren, who now sits as a United States Senator, said, you ought to look unto this fellow, Doug Laycock. And there he, <laughs> so it was the knowledge that the help of the people would collectively, we knew how to do it, and I was proud to have served in that capacity because it was a wonderful experience. Judge Friendly, uh, I, wrote one, uh, he wrote many things that, that attracted my interest as I know it did yours, but the one thing that always stuck with me was uh, not an opinion, but an article that he wrote which appeared in the University of Chicago Law Review. While I was then sitting on the district court, uh, burdened by all these post-conviction remedies. People were tried, they were convicted, they went they went to jail and then they started filing motions. And how to address that was a, was a major problem for the judiciary, and I won't go through all of that except to say that when he submitted in, and, it was, and published his law review article, it had a simple title. It said, is innocence irrelevant? And that set the tone for how we would approach these post-conviction motions. Uh, technicalities and so forth, unless a person made an arguable claim of innocence, they didn't get the same entitlement to keep running and combating uh, with technicalities the issues. That was the kind of person he had, and I always admired the kind of people that he selected for his, for his law clerks and the, the ones who have gone on to so many other things, like Chief Judge Garland and Judge Bodine and Pierre Laval and others, uh, that meant a lot to me. And I shared that experience both on the bench, and it was so good for me that I carried it on at the FBI and the CIA to have a kind of bench clerk or special assistants, as they were called, 
and, and uh, to follow them as they moved on into their own lives and, and with such pride in what they were able to do. Not to mention here our retiring secretary, Susan Appleton, seated with John Cameron, who became a member many years ago and uh, is now the acknowledged expert on real property law in the state of Michigan, who never misses a meeting. And they're here today, and I'm so proud of them. Others took different paths, as we all do as lawyers, and the, as in the interests of public service, what I call sometimes the private man in public life, who takes a job not for a permanent career, but to do a job that's needed, and then knows that he can go back to practicing law and to carry on the service as he had in the past. Among those that I have, and I won't mention them all, but one rose to become Deputy Secretary of Treasury, Neil Wolin. Ralph Gantz sits on the Supreme Court of Massachusetts. Uh, we had uh, Howard Gutman as our current ambassador to Belgium. Uh, we have uh, some, my handwriting I'm not reading, former dean at Mercer University, uh, John Sh and Phil Shelton. Uh, we had, uh, and currently, a counselor in the proposed foreign policy, John Bellinger. Uh, who led Rose to the top ranks in the State Department, legal department. Those are just some. And then the others who, who were exceptional as private lawyers, one, uh, Doug Winter, uh, who wrote the definitive work on Stephen King, of all things, <laughs> but was a serious expert in air, automo, airplane law, and came to help me, along with three other senior, now senior partners in their firm, to do the study of the Fort Hood Massacre a study that took a year and a half, pro bono, of course, and, it was, uh, and they did a beautiful job in putting together a series of recommendations. The director of the FBI accepted all 18, as I remember, recommendations, and I'm grateful to them for what they do and their attitude about their responsibilities as lawyers to preserve and protect the rule of law. I'm glad two of the memories, and I think my two minutes are about up and I'm about to close, but. <laughs> I remember with gratitude that I think that Chief Judge Garland has mentioned some of the problems we were having at the FBI when I came there. And I tried to set a theme when I was sworn in. And I promised in the presence of the President and the Chief Justice who swore me in and all of the others from the Congress and others there that we would do the work that the American people expected of us and we would do it in the way that the Constitution demanded of us. When they re redid the conference center, they put up a plaque, a big round uh, shield, and around it were the same words, we'll do the work that the American people expect of us in the way that the Constitution demands of us. And they have, and they have, and I'm so proud of them for that. Uh, the other experience at CIA help was helpful to me because in relations with Congress, the kind of problems we'll probably be experiencing, we're reading about them in the papers today, but we had the four C's that we decided we would follow, that all testimony must be correct, candid, complete, and consistent. We would not dance around the issues, but we would, if we could not answer the question for reasons in public for classification, we would say so, but we'd take the problem back, work it with them uh, and with our legal department, and we always were successful in doing that. And that, those, those four C's are still in place, and I'm so pleased about that. But through it all, I thought of how much has been accomplished in these years, not by me, but by, by the American Law Institute in these projects. The clarifications, the debate, the coming together of all issues, the bringing of our our academic, our judicial, and our practicing experiences. It's just been remarkable. And I think of the icons, such as Henry Friendly, and they have been great examples to us. And finally, I, I'd like to close with something that I use at almost every occasion when I'm talking to young lawyers. And it came from learned hand who also sat on the Second Circuit with Henry Friendly. And he just said this, and it sums it up, I think, how we all feel about this institution more than any other institution. He said, descended to us 
in some part molded by our hands, passed on to succeeding generations with reverence and with pride, we at once its servants and its masters renew our fealty to the law. Thank you so much for this opportunity.